Ah yes, Zodiac, every Ferdy's wet dream. Released in Raging Tempest and receiving support in Maximum Crisis, this group of monsters is based both on the Chinese Zodiac, their beast-like form and type, and the weapons they wield, forming the ultimate portmanteau, Zodiac. Today, we're going to be examining how these beasts tore up the Yu-Gi-Oh metagame, and so we ask, how good was Zodiac actually? Buckle in, because you're about to be taken on a wild ride. Zodiac is without a doubt the best archetype in Yu-Gi-Oh by far, and it had the monsters to back it up. The main Zodiacs are all normal summonable monsters that have two effects, one unique one, and one effect given to a Beast Warrior Xyz monster when used as material for one. No prizes for guessing which ones they'd most commonly be used for. Ram Ram and Bunny Blast could reborn or add back from the grave when destroyed. Whiptail could attach itself from hand or field as a quick effect to a Zoo Xyz. Thoroughblade discarded any Zoo card to draw a card on normal or special, and Rat Pier was a foolish burial for any Zodiac card on normal. These monsters were all playable in some capacity and had pretty decent effects, but what made them especially deadly were their effects when used as material. Bunny Blast and Ram Ram acted as protection from targeted spell and trap effects, allowing the user to non-once per turn detach a material to negate the activation of said card. Whiptail allowed you to banish any monster the Zodiac battled after damage calculation, turning any Zodiac Xyz into a one-sided DD Warrior Lady, which was especially useful in certain matchups such as against Bujin. Thoroughblade would give your monster piercing, but all of these would pale in comparison to Rat Pier who as, as a soft once per turn, allowed you to special summon a Zodiac Rat Pier from your hand or deck. Now you may be wondering, Stevie, how are we supposed to get the material for the Xyz plays? Don't they need multiple materials in order to be summoned? Well, yes and no. The Zodiac Xyz monsters did need multiple Xyz material in order to be summoned organically. However, they had a second stipulation where, once per turn, you could use a differently named Singular Zodiac as the entire Xyz material, similar to Link 1's in Yu-Gi-Oh!, and this broke Zodiacs wide open. The Zodiac Xyz monsters were, to put it lightly, broken. They all had amazing effects back in 2017, and even in 2022 still stand the test of time. The Xyz monsters share the same effect of having an attack and defense stat equal to the combined total of their Zodiac materials, but they all shared a uniquely broken effect. Borbo allowed you to attack directly and had a second effect that never came up, allowing for quick, easy damage. Tiger Mortar allowed you to recycle materials from the grave to gain stats, utility, protection, and additional activations of your effects, which was especially useful for turn 3 setups if you were maxied turn 1. Zodiac Broadbowl was incredible, not just because it could be made of any two level 4s, the easiest to summon Zodiac outside of its own archetype, but because it was a fire formation tanky on legs, allowing you to search any beast warrior you may need at the time, most notably Whiptail or a Rat Pier. And finally, Zodiac Dryden, a card that would spawn the slang for a monster with a quick effect of single target destruction with its... Well, quick effect single target destruction for face-up cards. Even their spell and trap lineup was incredible. Zodiac Barrage gave Zodiac another outlet to summon Rat Pier or any other zoo from the deck by popping a card, usually itself, and Zodiac Combo was a great send off of Rat Pier, allowing for insane recyclability with its graveyard effect to shuffle back spent copies of Rat Pier and any other zoos you may want to see again and to draw a card on top of it. To make matters worse, Zodiac was indirectly supported by a bevy of other unrelated cards, such as Fire Formation Tanky, which was able to act as a searcher for any Zodiac, and MX Saber Invoker, a rank 3 which could be made with Speedroid Terror Top and the later released Balbaboon to special any Zodiac from the deck. However, this deck did have certain weaknesses. First, it only had two summons per turn at best, being its normal and the occasional barrage. And secondly, the deck's primary in-archetype disruption came from Dryden's. This led to players playing all sorts of garbage in order to counteract Zoo. There are way too many to list off, but here are just a couple. Some players tried to take advantage of Zoo's lack of protection, playing cards such as Storming Mirror Force, Forbidden Apocrypha, and Enemy Controller. Some players tried to counteract the deck's disruption in Dryden, playing cards such as My Body as a Shield and Pianissimo in order to give their monsters certain protection. 
and some players tried to prevent the deck from ever summoning at all, opting for cards such as the Solemn Brigade and Dimensional Barrier. Even extension tools were played with Zodiac in mind, most notably Shuffle Reborn and Monster Reborn Reborn. However, these shortcomings were outweighed by their astronomically abundant upsides. This small, efficient, and deadly package of monsters and spells, indirectly supported by dozens of other cards, by no surprise would absolutely dominate the metagame. And at YCS Seattle, 10 days after the release of Zoo, 28 of the top 32 slots would be taken up by Zodiac and Zodiac variants. It's here where we need to make something clear. There are so many event tops and variants with Zodiac that if I were to list off each and every one, we would be here until Auction Series 2 was released. So, for in-person events, we're going to be sticking with first and occasionally second place premier finishes and only touchstoning on the dozens of weirder variants that people actually topped with. At Seattle, Alexis Rodriguez Jimenez would win the event of Zodiac Kaiju, a blind second variant that focused on cracking boards open with interrupted Kaiju Slumber and the Kaijus alongside board breakers and hand traps that were especially deadly since Rat plus Slumber was an OTK. Additionally, Billy Break would place first after Swiss and place top 8 at the event with 60 card Infernoid Kaizu, opting to high roll with the deck's natural consistency and the explosive factors of the newly released Grass Looks Greener and Void Feast, making Infernoid engines far more viable and consistent. Esala would also place top 16 with a variant of Zodiac that emphasized its recursive abilities in the trap department with Paleozoic Zodiac, featuring a bevy of traps including, of course, the Paleos and even Blaze Accelerator Reload alongside a Volcanic Scattershot package to act as a pseudo-quickplay Raigeki. At Atlanta, Zodiac would not actually win the event, but it would take up 27 of the top 32 top cut slots and place as a runner up behind Paleo, with Chase Cunningham piloting Pure Zoo. It would also be at this event that fusion enforcers would be made legal, and under the wing of Kamal Crooks would see its first top at top 32 with invoked Zodiac. At Guatemala, 13 of the top 16 top cut slots were Zoo and its variants, primarily Pure, Infernoid, and Metal Foes, another Zoo variant that focused around explosive pendulum plays of Algahest, counter traps like Solemn Strike backed up by Ariadne, and if you opened well enough, Magispector Unicorn Kirin, one of the best pendulum monsters ever printed because of its protection and removal. The event, of course, would be won by Gerald Chavez playing Infernoid Zoo. At YCS Prague, Zoo would swamp Top Cut again with a 27 out of Top 32 cut representation. One notable deck that survived the Catacall was actually Shiranui, a Lightsworn variant with an extremely heavy zombie engine. Zodiac would again fall to Paleo, piloted by Joshua Schmidt. What's funny about his experience was that from Top 32 to the finals, he only played against 60 card decks, meaning that his Game 1 grasses were all basically useless. Billy Break would ultimately play second with Infernoid Zoo. After this YCS, Zodiac would have one of the highest event to top ratios, where after only 4 events, Zodiac would have 95 out of the 112 possible topping slots and 2 event wins, both only ever losing in the finals to Paleo. The March 2017 ban list was highly anticipated, and after the complete dominance of Zoo, everybody was itching for a Pepe style emergency ban list to curb the deck's power level. Despite anticipations, players got anything but that with this list. For the relevant hits in regards to Zoo, Magispector Unicorn Kieran and Vanity's Emptiness were now banned. The banning of Kieran was a heavy loss to Metal Foe Zoo, as Kieran was one of its most important boss monsters, and the banning of Vanity's meant that Zoo would no longer lose to a random sack off of a limited Vanity's. Maxi, Future Fusion, and Imperial Order were now limited. Maxi's limitation would turn the format into a whole lot more sacky. Future Fusion gave 60 card Zoonoids another way to bait Ash Blossom when revealing Tierra, acting as a fourth copy of Grass if resolved successfully, and Imperial Order was another sacky countermeasure to cards such as the previously mentioned Future Fusion, Grass, and Kaiju Slumber. Speaking of Slumber, on the semi-limited list, Slumber alongside Ratpier were semi-limited, which in reality didn't really do a whole lot of anything. Sure, it was a bit harder to rank 4 spam in OTK, but the deck would soon develop an entirely new combo that would put players into a frenzy just weeks later. 
At YCS Denver, the first event after the ban list, players proved yet again that Zodiac was an absolute menace with a dominant 29 out of top 32 cut representation. Despite losing Kirin, 7 Metal Foes Zoo players actually managed to top the event, deciding to pivot into Ariadne setups to search Solemns and eventually went as far as to play the newly unlimited Sangan to search the newly limited Maxi. And at YCS Bogota, the last event before the beginning of the end, 12 out of the top 16 slots were populated with Zoo. Maximum Crisis just dropped and, well, caused the Yu-Gi-Oh community to go into Maximum Crisis mode. This set introduced additional support for the Zodiac archetype and a ton of additional support for new Zodiac variants. Yeah, they definitely needed the help. Let's start off with the Zoo cards. First of all, Cataroost was introduced. Cataroost shared a similar effect to Ram Ram and Bunny Blast, where if it was destroyed, it shuffled a Zodiac card in the graveyard back into the deck. Not really that impactful, but its material effect was to negate targeted monster effects, which had pretty good applications across the field, especially against players who were hoping to clear the board with their own Dryden's. Next was Zodiac Hammer Kong. This card was absolutely incredible in regards to protecting your own monsters from most types of disruption and players trying to protect their own zoos, being that your opponent could not target any face-up Zodiac monster on the field with card effects, which of course included their own, so no more PNEC motion shenanigans. And finally, Zodiac Chocodyne provided a way to generate incredible board advantage, thanks to our ability to revive spent zoos at the cost of negating their effects and locking them out of being Xyz material. She worked especially well alongside Tiger Mortar, who was able to tuck materials underneath any zoo Xyz Chocodyne might have revived, most specifically Drynet and Hammer Kong, the former for disruption for the following turn, and the latter because since it was negated, it did not detach a material during the end phase, allowing to keep up its protection effect. If Zodiac was being argued for whether or not it was tier 0 before, at YCS Pittsburgh, the first event after the release of Maximum Crisis, those debates were put to a rest with a first ever fabled 32 out of 32 Zodiac top cut slot representation. Of these variants, 13 were on Pure, 8 on True Draco Zodiac, 7 on Kaiju Zoo, 2 on Zoonoids, and 1 each on Paleo Zoo and Plant Zoo. Yeah, we couldn't find a list for this. You may be asking, what is Draco Zoo? Well, in Maximum Crisis, the true Draco archetype was released, an archetype of tribute monsters who could be summoned by tributing continuous spells and traps and generate resources when your opponent activated a card or effect, or destroy cards your opponent controlled when their spells and traps were sent to the graveyard. But the absolute king of the true Draco cards was Masterpiece, the true Draco slaying king. This monster is the stuff of nightmares. You needed to tribute two cards in order to summon it. However, it was unaffected by the effects of cards with the same card type as the original type of cards tributed for its tribute summon. This meant that if you say tributed a fire formation tanky and a ram ram to summon him, he would be unaffected both by both spell and monster effects. To make matters even worse, he was also a better dryden, where as a quick effect you could banish a continuous spell or trap from your graveyard and target a card on the field which didn't have to be face up and destroy it. The card was, to put it lightly, absolutely broken. Most decks simply just could not out this card, and if you tried to set up any cards to deal with the masterpiece, they would just be popped by it if they knew what you were up to, such as popping a freshly set Torrential. This drove many decks, especially Paleo, into being essentially unplayable due to an unwinnable matchup versus masterpiece. Aaron Furman would win the event playing Draco Zoo. However, this would not be the only thing popularized at this event, and here is where we talk about Zodiac's darkest chapter, Fusion Sub Zoo. Zodiac builds in Raging Tempest have been experimenting with Fusion Substitute Zoo, but it was at Pittsburgh where it was truly discovered and optimized. With Lunalite Black Sheep acting as a searcher for Fusion Substitute, you could use two XE Zodiacs or one hard drawn instant fusion in order to make Elder Entity Norden, one of the craziest cards of all time. Norden on summon allowed you to target and special a level 4 or lower monster in your graveyard to special it, at the cost of negating it and banishing it when Norden left the field. Quick note, this card was not once per turn. By looping Norden multiple times by detaching it for Dicosto Emerald, shuffling it back into the ED, and resummoning it with Fusion Substitute, you are quite literally able to draw 5 or more cards on your turn off of just a 2 or 3 card combo. 
If Old Zodiac was oppressive for drawing 2-3 cards with high roll hands, this variant kicked it into overdrive. This deck was the definition of having your cake and being able to eat it too. You had combos that didn't take up your entire hand. It was consistent. It played an amazing control game. Disruption, draw power, Saki trap cards, this deck literally had it all. And at German Nationals, of the top 64 deck slots, 52 of them were taken up by Zodiac and its variants. Seeing the deck's dominant performance, Konami tried to beat around the bush again, addressing only the deck's most problematic surrounding cards by banning Norden alongside the limitation of Terra Top and Grass, severely limiting the consistency of the MX Saber Invoker engine and 60 card Infernoid Zoo. However, these changes didn't address the core of the problem, that Zodiac was still absolutely broken. At North American Nationals, although the deck breakdown was not made publicly available, at least 14 of the top 32 decks were Zodiac or Zodiac variants, which included a second place finish under Roland Fang playing Pure Zoo. And at the EU WCQ, 54 of the 64 top cut slots were occupied by Zoo and its variants. Marcello Barberi would pull one of the greatest feats in competitive Yu-Gi-Oh history and end the event 17-0 clean sweeping the entire tournament without dropping a single match. Master Roll 4 is introduced, creating a massive stopgap for non-link related decks with the introduction of the extra monster zone, meaning that if you were going to summon a Synchro or Xyz monster into one of them, that was all you were going to get. People looked to this change with disdain, but with mild relief overall in hopes that Zodiac's reign would finally come to an end. Unfortunately, in Code of the Duelist, the first core set of the Link Vrains era, Mrs. Radiance was released, a Link to Earth that set up two EMZs in the main monster zone, making Zoo one of the only decks that could operate efficiently under Master Rule 4, effectively nullifying the change overall. At YCS Remini, the first event after Master Roll 4, Zodiac and its variants would take up 26 of the top 32 top cut slots and would win the event under the wing of Andreas Vrelos, playing Zodiac Pure. It was after this domination that Konami finally had enough. On September of 2017, the largest ban list of all time would be slammed down and Zodiac was absolutely slaughtered. Broadbull, Dryden's, and Digusto Emerald were now banned, completely shutting off Zoo's proactive plays and resource generation, and Zodiac, Ratpier, and Interrupted Kaiju Slumber were put to one, cutting off any potential plays for Rat Loops and ODK lines. This change immediately killed the deck, as moving forward for the next three years, the deck would see no play whatsoever, only to be occasionally used alongside Lunalite and Time Thieves. Overall, Zodiac ended the year as without a doubt, the highest performing deck in the history of Yu-Gi-Oh ever. It was a terror to behold in every sense of the word, and it showed that with its chokehold over the metagame. No matter what variant, no matter what tried to oppose it, nothing except the deck's slaughter on the banlist could keep it down. It's peak pandemic season in 2020, and Konami decided to cast yet another plague upon us with the February 2020 ban list, giving players back Dryden at the cost of a newly limited Zodiac Barrage. However, despite initial promise, Zodiac had an all new host of problems it had to deal with coming into the modern metagame. First off was its slow style of gameplay. Pure Zoo's primary strategy was to literally just sit on a Dryden, or if you are feeling frisky, Mega Clops, and hope for the best alongside whatever hand traps and trap cards you might have drawn. Second was the format it was released in. Yu-Gi-Oh was moving at a speed that eclipsed even Fusion Sub Zoo, with Secret Slayers and Link Hulk Auroradon decks running around. Deciding to forego that to normal summon a Thoroughblade seemed unwise to say the least. And third, it was desperate for Broadbull, having inconsistent access to Whiptail, follow-up, and easy material engrave for Chalcanine and Tiger Mortar setups made the deck much more difficult to get off to the races. Although indirect support came in the form of Drill Driver Vespinado, the deck was ultimately just too slow, too reliant on the cards that surrounded it, and it lacked a win condition. But Konami wouldn't let Zoo die just yet, because in Phantom Rage, nestled alongside Virtual Worlds and the Tribrigates came without a doubt the best XE support ever released, Divine Arsenal AA Zeus Sky Thunder, or as I like to call him, Zeus. 
it was a rank 12 monster that, similar to the Zodiacs, could be summoned atop an Xyz monster you control if an Xyz monster battled that turn and transferred its materials to it. As a non once per turn quick effect, you could detach two materials from it, send all other cards from the field to the fucking graveyard. This card fit perfectly at home in Zoo, and thanks to Borbo, you would always have a direct outlet to get to a massive multi-material Zeus thanks to being able to attack directly and to stack up multiple Zoos as material to make a 5, 6, or even sometimes 7 material Zeus. This was the win con Zodiac was vying for, and immediately after its release, Zodiac finally began to pick up steam again, primarily in control shells. At LCS 8, Alex Pavalenka would place top 16 with blind second Zodiacs, opting for cards such as Alpha, Pinkertops, and Kaijus to supplement a Zeus strategy. Paulo Goncalves would place top 8 at this event, playing a more trap-focused variant of Zoo, playing it alongside Dodmatica and Eldlish. After this event, however, another gift from Konami would rain down from above with the December 2020 ban list, most notably banning Dragon Buster Destruction Sword, Link Cross, and Smoke Grenade of the Thief, all cards part of combo decks and oppressive strategies that had a chokehold on Zodiac now finally gone, and Zodiac took this opportunity in strive. At LCS9, Paulo would top again with Eldritch Dogmatica, however, it was clear that this format was going to be slowly warped around another oppressive combo deck, Virtual World. VW was already seeing play thanks to its ability to make VFD alongside Chuche, however, upon further optimization, players figured out how to make two of these guys and it ate almost every deck alive. It seemed not to have a single bad matchup across the board, and mating and citing hate for the deck seemed absolutely necessary. Zoo ended the 2020 year with a moderate return to form. Despite the initial struggle, the release of Zeus would give it just enough power to sneak its way back into the metagame. Zodiac, alongside every other deck, is struggling to put up a fight against VFD. However, thanks to the February 2021 banlist, VFD would finally be banned and Zodiac would finally have a chance to take center stage as the premier control deck. However, the deck was still going through some definite growing pains, most notably because the deck had not been solved yet regarding deck building and combos. People were still sold on the theory that Eldritch Zodiac was still the best way to play the deck, some people considered pure, while others began to seriously lab out Zodiac Tribrigade lines. The deck saw tons of representation at Remote Duel Extravaganzas in the UK and of course in the LCS. At the UK Remote Duel Extravaganza, Zodiac snuck into top 16 with three top cut slots, two being Tribrigade Zoo and one being Eldritch Zoo. However, the sparse tricklings of Zodiac's performance this year would be completely overshadowed with the release of Lightning Overdrive and the release of Tribrigade Bear Brum, the Rampant Rampager. Tribrigade already proved itself to be an amazing mid-range deck, but with the release of Bear Brum, the deck was elevated to an entirely new level. It had a new Link 2 it could go into that acted as extension, but more importantly, it gave Tribrigade a direct avenue to search out Revolt, a combination of Dimension Fusion and IP Masquerina to disrupt the opponent on their own turn with Shurag, and to generate additional advantage with Kit and Nerval. And Zodiac Tribrigade absolutely dominated. At LCS 14, the deck would occupy 9 of the top 16 slots, 5 of them being Pure Zoo and the 4 being Tribrigade Zoo. The combination of consistency, hand trap abundance, easy Zeus lines, Dryden's and Ram Ram lines allowing for amazing board spam, and disruption stemming from Opelousa, Double Dragon Lords, Dryden and Revolt were just too much for most decks to handle finally taking home a first place finish under Blake Thunderberg with Tri-Brigade Zoo. The deck would also see a giant card win and a fourth place finish under Herman Hansen, the premier innovator for Zodiac's development during this period playing Zoo Pure. And finally, the deck would see a first place finish after years at an official Konami event at the hands of Yishan McNabb at the NA Remote Duel Extravaganza playing Zodiac Tri. 
On the July 2021 ban list, Konami knew from previous experience that they had to strike at the source, and Zodiac Dryden was banned yet again. The Dryden ban served as both a hit to Pure and Tri-Brigade Zodiac, both of which were extremely meta-dominant. This hit effectively killed the Pure Zoo variants. On the side of tri Zoo, however, the banning of Dryden meant that the deck couldn't play through a negate on Rat Pierre without Kuros for extension, and also cut off lines where you would pop Bear Brum for a Revolt Search. Despite these changes, the deck was still far from dead, as its combo lines were still just as effective, although slightly hampered. At the July Remote Duel Extravaganza, the deck would see itself in 12 of the top 32 top cut slots, with 6 being tri -Zoo and 6 being Pure, with Herman Hansen taking first place after Swiss playing tri -Zoo. And finally, the deck would see its last premier event win at the hands of Raphael Navin at the Remote Duel YCS playing tri -Zoo. On the October 2021 ban list, Konami put an end to things once and for all with the ban of Zodiac Barrage and the limiting of Tenki, two massive consistency hits to Zodiac overall, resulting in the deck's ultimate demise and being beaten out by Trivagade Pure for the best control deck of the format. With the release of the Lyralisk support just a few weeks later, tri -Zoo completely fell out of favor in comparison to Bird Up and Pure Tri, and Zoo unfortunately hasn't been able to replicate its performance since. And that's it! So how good was Zodiac actually? It was and remains the best deck in all of Yu-Gi-Oh! history. Although other decks have certainly come close, such as Sky Striker and the Dragon Rulers, no deck has been able to replicate the absolute dominance Zodiac has had, and been able to perform year after year whenever Konami decides to give it an inch, even if it is just a singular Dryden. It just goes to show that no matter how much things change, Zodiac will always reign supreme. Thank you so much for watching everyone, special thanks to my team which you're seeing on screen here for their help with researching and producing these videos, and if you liked the video and you want to see more, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know in the comment section what you guys thought about Zodiac, and thank you so much to our patrons for your continued support and everyone watching at home. Shouts out to the guy that robbed PewDiePie's house.